Okay, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's uh, it's really a pleasure to to be here, and uh, a special thanks to Tosia who really uh, helped us a lot for this all this technical preparation. And I knew it was it's a lot of work. Um, so today I will uh, be talking. I don't know where here. There we go. Let's see on the key. Just here, okay. Okay, thanks. So, okay, thanks. So I will be talking about uh, mice and mostly about behavior uh, and behavioral context in which we can record uh, ultrasonic vocalization in mice. And uh, first I will uh, talk briefly about the major parameters of USV in mice and you will see they are very similar uh, than the one we have in rats. Uh, of course. Um, I will talk about the environmental and behavioral modulators of USV and uh, showing specifically the effect of novelty that trigger a lot of USV and the social context. And then I will end up talking about uh, age of recording and uh, the gender effect, which is a, a, um, just early uh, interest for, for us in, in my lab. Um, everything you will see mostly will be recorded in males, and the end, uh, I will talk about females uh, recording. Um, so the major parameters that we have uh, measured in mice uh, and that were issued from a work in social behavior in male animals were um, measured using a, a, a protocol, a social interaction protocol that I designed 20 years ago already. Um, and which shows that uh, in a social interaction, animals have to have real social interaction uh, to emit a lot of vocalization, and I will show you that later. And with uh, Fabrice uh, de Chaumont here, we um, just uh, uncovered the, the full uh, social repertoire of animals uh, in this paper, um, the diadic repertoire. And this protocol is was entitled to, um, was uh, designed to study decision-making, social decision-making in mice. And so what we wanted was to uh, push as much as possible the number of decisions that animals could do uh, between having, um, gaining two different innate rewards, which are uh, having a social contact and having uh, the ability to explore novelty. And this was done by uh, isolating for a few weeks animals before the task and habituating them to a novel place for uh, uh, some, some minutes before, before the, the task. So uh, in this particular protocol, we have found that we can record a lot of ultrasonic vocalization in male uh, dyads. And in this video uh, that was taken by uh, our students, uh, Cyril L'Hopitalier and Alexis Faure in the lab, um, we can see if it working it should be if it's not working it's not a big deal it's just to show uh, that animals ha have um, a peaceful uh, social interaction although there are two males together that don't know each other at all in a new environment a new cage um, with clean beddings and uh, they can um, just show a very varied um, a behavioral repertoire and a lot of ultrasonic vocalization. And what we recorded and that we can see here is that we can have the number of ultrasonic vocalization recorded in this uh, paradigm, this social interaction test. And what is different between these two uh, bars data showed here is that in the black bars, it's uh, ultrasonic vocalization that are recorded when one of the two animals have been socially isolated before the task. And here, non-animals have been isolated and they are doing exactly the same social interaction task. So first we could see that the number of vocalization is really dramatically different. And here are others, other conditions that I will talk later in which we can have uh, vocalization, but animals are here alone, exploring the environment, just exploring novelty, or in a restrained stress. 
And I will talk about this uh, particular behavior later. So we can also see the duration of uh, calls are different between animals that have been isolated before and animals that have not. And also the frequency of these calls. So uh, the frequency of animals that have been isolated before the task is much higher than the one that have not been. What I thought was uh, mostly interesting was that if you have uh, animals that have been isolated before the social task, there is a, a linear positive correlation between the number of USVs uh, emitted and the duration of contact. And we have observed that in all kinds of animals we have uh, recorded um, so far. And this is not the case when animals were not isolated before, suggesting that maybe uh, the type of calls and what these calls mean for the animals exchanging uh, USVs may be different, but that the call parameters, whether they are the number, the frequency, and the durations, are modulated uh, both by the behavior that animals are doing, of course, but also by the way they are reared before the task. And so we, oh, sorry. Okay, I'm not sure I can come back, but anyway. Okay, uh, so we, we ended up with this uh, representation showing or uh, suggesting that um, USVs are carrying some emotional content, but also some motivational content, because they are definitely very different regarding number, frequency, and duration uh, in animals that have been isolated, so that have more uh, motivation to have social contact. And I remind you that here it's male-male interactions in adults, right? So this is just a small summary of what I've shown you and that I, uh, we discussed. Um, now I will be showing different kinds of behavior during which animals are emitting vocalization and focusing of uh, the effect of novelty, which is triggering a lot of attention. And uh, we can uh, also relate that to what uh, Stefan has shown us about the role of acetylcholine, which is very much triggered by novelty, by uh, novel places, novel conspecific that animals can encounter. And also we'll talk about the environment of life and not of behavior. Um, and also I will show you some data about the importance of having social reciprocity to exchange ultrasonic vocalization. So in this first uh, slide, uh, what we can see is a non-social context. So it's a number of USV recorded, so it's the call rate uh, recording, recorded in animals that have been not isolated, isolated for six days or for 21 days, but when they are exploring a novel environment, not during social context. And we can see that in that case, um, having been isolated can decrease the call rate while it increases when we are measuring the call rate during restrained stress which is called here. You can also notice that the number of vocalization emitted during restraint stress is very uh, small, but still significantly improved or increased by a former isolation. In the social context, although what you could see here is the contact time spent in, uh, of animals or the time they spend in contact together in different situations. So here you have the three same social interaction task that you saw before in animals that have not been isolated, isolated for six days or for 21 days. And as previously, we found that uh, isolating animals before the task increase the contact, the duration of contact, and also the number of ultrasonic vocalization. Uh, what is interesting, it's uh, this uh, contact time and decreased number of vocalization associated with the um, behavioral uh, task in which an animal, male animal, is making contact with an anesthetized other male animal. Okay, so we can see that the time spent in contact is very high, but the number of vocalization emitted is very small. And it is replicated here in another way. So high contact, but very small uh, number of calls. 
as compared to the social interaction task in which, in which there is a reciprocal interaction. What was interesting is that the repertoire, the vocal repertoire is very dramatically different. Uh, in the social interaction, you have a very large number of uh, vocal types and particularly these modulated calls here that completely disappear in animals having contact with an anesthetized animal. So we can see that uh, it's not only the, uh, oh, oh, I'm just close with that. Uh, it's not only having a lot of duration of contact, uh, spending a lot of time in contact that is enough to trigger a lot of vocalization. And then we compare all social tasks in which animals can have real reciprocal interaction uh, with the three chamber task, which is very much used to study uh, social motivation in which animals can uh, travel back and forth freely between a, a, a pot containing a social conspecific and anything else, which could be either we tested with food, we tested with nothing, another empty pot, okay? What we found is that the call rate is very low in these three chamber tasks as compared again to all social interaction tasks. So here you have the same animals previously isolated either during the social interaction task or during the three chamber. And so it's again, adult males. What was also interesting instead of just focusing on the number of vocalization is to show that uh, there is no correlation in the three chamber task between the number of vocalization and the time spent in contact uh, as we have found and we found um, many times in the social interaction. So again, suggesting that animals exchange information or at least emit vocalization during this task, even if they are emitting a very little number and very varied number. And we have this all noticed this uh, uh, individual variability as discussed uh, previously by uh, previous speakers. Uh, but still, uh, I think it's very interesting to notice this absence of correlation between a significant behavior and the number of vocalization emitted. And then with my colleague, uh, Frédéric Chauveau, and with a student, Eleonore Lefebvre, we did this uh, very simple experiment uh, that was done during restrained stress, again, in male mice. Uh, we did an experiment in which the animal that was under the restrained stress was either alone, which is here, or we presented uh, to it uh, a, a visitor, so a non and family, not familiar conspecific that was either behind the wall or under a basket or was freely moving. And we can see that there is an increased call rate uh, when there is a visitor, so where there is a conspecific present, and when this conspecific was moving around, although you can notice that the call rate is very small, but still, and we can see that, um, I, and I really like this curve because it shows the frequency, the distribution of the frequency um, as a proportion of the uh, USVs in the different conditions. So either animals were freely moving, but just exploring alone the a novel environment and all in the restrained stress. And we can see that we have the similar distribution in both conditions when animals are alone, okay, but that the peak frequency is around uh, 50 kilohertz, okay, between 45 and 55 kilohertz. And it, it is much uh, increased during the social interaction task. So uh, this could be very interesting regarding what uh, Stefan has showed us uh, about the uh, variation between the cholinergic and the dopaminergic system in uh, uh, maybe aversive or stressful condition and more uh, appetitive conditions uh, such as the social interaction. Okay, and then we decided, oh, if I come back, to come back to this situation. So animals in a restrained stress 
um, and a, a, a conspecific roaming, roaming around, which promotes the highest uh, ultrasonic rate uh, in the restrained stress. And then we did something uh, to see whether the novelty of the situation has an effect. And so we did, the animal was either alone, and then we add this visitor, and this doesn't change the number of calls emitted. But if we do the contrary, we put at the same time the animal in the restrained stress and the visitor together, this promotes vocalization. Um, and so, and then the, the vocalization decreased after a while. So there is also this effect of fast habituation that uh, Marcus has always, uh, also uh, shown in, in some of the, his paper, um, that there is habituation and that novelty trigger uh, a large uh, number of calls emitted, even though the animal is, is alone, but particularly when there is a, a conspecific around. So the number of calls can be modulated by novelty and by the presence of a conspecific. What I also should say, I'm not showing it here, I'm just focusing on, on the number of calls, but the frequency of calls emitted during restraint stress remains around 40, 45 kilohertz. So lower than during, much lower than during the, the social interaction task. So uh, what we've seen is that the duration uh, of social contact can predict the number of calls, but only in the case of real and reciprocal social interaction. Um, and that both the immediate environment, so the environment in which we measure the behavior and the rearing conditions can alter USV parameters uh, in, in mice. So at least in male mice. So now I will uh, show you our most recent data that were uh, recently collected during her PhD by our student, the student uh, we, we co-supervised with Alexi Faure, uh, who is Nast Nastasia Mihov. And she's interested in understanding uh, whether uh, living in a, a social, uh, social environment and whether the uh, social uh, parameters can influence uh, the further during, uh, during life um, cognitive behavior. And uh, so we are also enriching uh, the life of animals. And we all know that uh, standard conditions that we call standard condition uh, is not really standard, it's very impoverished. So what Nastasia is doing, I'm not sure the, the movie will work, but it's not a big deal. Uh, she uh, was studying during this experiment, uh, females and males um, reared from adolescence, so from the 30, in an enriched environment, uh, that you may see or not here. Okay, it's not, but I I can describe it to you. But anyway, you know how our rich environment is. Uh, females or males separated, okay, we are not doing uh, reproduction, um, uh, are, are living uh, 12 animals in this very big environment and uh, which is changing every day. Or they are uh, reared in a standard uh, environment. And what Nastasia was doing, she reared these animals in this environment from adolescence through adult age. And then she measured the same behavior of social interaction, but not only, she measured many other uh, behaviors that I will not be talking about today. Um, uh, during adolescence, and then she measured the same behavior when, ani when animals are adults. And then during the social task, the one that you have seen before, she could notice that the number of vocalization that recorded in females here and in males here and reached here, standard here, uh, is uh, the, this number is very much increased in female as compared to males. So as a lot of people were telling me, oh, 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 we know that females talk more than males, okay? Uh, but it's not only the number, uh, it's also the duration of a vocalization, which is very much increased in females as compared to males. And the frequency is not so different statistically, but uh, you can see that there are there is a big variability in males as compared to females. So there is both uh, uh, an effect of uh, gender here, but also an effect of rearing conditions. And then, as I said, animals were tested 
at adolescence and then at adulthood and throughout life they continue to live in, in their own enriched or standard condition. And so they are the same animals that we tested there. So there is again this effect of increased number of vocalization in females as compared to males um, and an effect of enriched environment in number, duration, and also in mean frequency. So the frequency, I mean, you probably can't see because it's very small, but it's uh, 60 uh, kilohertz here for females, and it's around 40, 45 in males. So what you can see is that both the number, the duration, and the frequency, of course, occur during social tasks. So in the ads of animals of the same sex, not knowing each other, uh, are modulated by gender and by the environment of life, also at adult age. So we were really wondering whether it was the same animals that vocalize a lot, because you can see this large individual variability, and that's what we're interested in my lab. It's whether uh, individual variability during social interaction can promote or construct the cognitive uh, variability uh, uh, later in life. So uh, we were wondering whether it was the same animals that were vocalizing a lot um, uh, or at longer duration or at higher uh, frequency in, in, uh, in these animals. And so Nastasia did these correlation plots. So we didn't, it's very recent. So she did this just two days before I'm coming. So uh, uh, it, it's, it's not uh, statistically tested yet, but it was interesting, I think, to show this to you that uh, there is no correlation in males, first of all. And then we can see that in females, there is this positive correlation in enriched females between a number of calls emitted at adolescent and at adulthood, and this negative correlation emitted in standard animals. Um, and these correlations also exist for uh, the mean frequency uh, of vocalization emitted at adulthood, which you can see is can be very high. Um, and the duration, of course, you can notice that there is never any correlation on these parameters in males. So we can uh, notice that for now, I have no uh, just ideas. Uh, I have some ideas, but I have no proof of what does it mean to have these correlations uh, between these different uh, for example, the frequency, the animals that emit uh, uh, a high frequency at adolescence are the ones that emit at low frequency at adulthood. What does it mean? We have some data uh, collected formally showing that uh, animals that are, um, that have a high, um, uh, are mostly um, a dominant animals emit more vocalization. Uh, whether this is the case in these animals yet, I don't know, but what Nastasia is doing at the moment is she establishing profiles, individual profiles in animals in which ultrasonic vocalization will take place. So uh, maybe next year we'll have more data for that. So, so far what we have shown is that the females emit significantly uh, more and longer USVs than males during this social interaction uh, occurring between animals that don't know each other and that are of the same sex. And this is modified by enriched rearing. And this correlation data suggests that maybe there is a vocal signature that could exist in females, particularly during the social and reciprocal interaction, but this is just a suggestion. So we have seen that the major parameters of USVs that everyone collects in rats also holds in, in, in mice. Um, that, and they are interesting to measure altogether because they can carry or, or rely on the emotional state of the animals, whether it's emotional state or traits of personality that could be very interesting to discuss. That environment of life, uh, and now we rear animals in colony, so we could see that everything we have found previously only in males living in sterile environment maybe should be re revised. Um, but definitely that the exposure to novelty and to real reciprocal social interaction is really important.
and to trigger intrasonic vocalization and to modulate uh, their uh, duration and probably their frequency as well. That age and gender are factors that could influence what we measure, but it influences uh, social behavior. So it's it's uh, a very uh, expected findings. And we are very interested in the individual traits. So how these traits evolve and are created with life and uh, including not only social factors, but other types of behavior like motivational factors, anxiety, reactivity levels of animals, and whether this predicts uh, cognitive behaviors and uh, behavior strategies, that's uh, what we are uh, looking at at the moment. Okay, so these are all the people who uh, participated uh, in this uh, in this data, um, and we are collaborating with Adam on, on that topic, and that's Nastasia, who for who you saw the last uh, the, the last data in females animals, and uh, Leonardo and Vanessa are two postdocs uh, coming from Brazil from the lab of uh, Roberto Andreatini and Maria Vital, uh, with whom we have uh, established a quite long term collaboration, a very fruitful collaboration right now. And this is Alexi Four, who is uh, working with me in the lab uh, for. Uh, decades now. So uh, I expect him to be able to come and, and give a talk next time because he's doing very nice work uh, about optogenetic modulations uh, in social behavior. Okay, thank you. Have you considered looking at uh, either social defeat in males okay. or uh, maternal aggression in females to sort of tease out these lower vocalizations? And, yeah. you know, that it may be very interesting to see if there's a little supine living. Yes, oh, definitely. So, uh, yeah, um, all of that could be really interesting. We we haven't thought for defeated males right now, but we are uh, starting a program to study uh, the, the maternal behavior and uh, maternal abusive uh, mothers that uh, for which we had a, a funding recently. So this is really uh, something we will look forward to do. Uh, for the um, uh, for defeated males, so far we didn't. And purposely because we didn't want to mix up with social defeat and social behavior measures, but definitely that could be very interesting. Yeah. The question is, what is the ideal condition to elicit a high level of resilience during the particular self-directing? So I assume sort of isolation before, but then for how long? Enrichment before, but then for how long? And how does this work yeah. together? Uh, so that's the first question. The second is, can you say a bit more about restraint stress? What does it actually mean? They are really cheap and really restrained? Or? Yeah, okay. Uh, so for the... Um... For the first part of the questions, uh, animals were uh, isolated for three weeks um, before the task um, in, in our, our social interaction protocol. And that's why we were wondering whether, because we know that social isolation will promote initially uh, the dopaminergic system activity, and then there is habituation to that. So that's why we didn't want to have this too small, too short, uh, um, isolation. Uh, it was a purpose to just increase the motivation to have a social contact, and that really worked. Um, but your question about enrichment, about the duration, so we start enriching animals uh, as soon as they are uh, after winning. So we put them in a colony of same sex from, uh, let's say, around 27 days, something like that, and then they stayed enriched for um, all their life. So they stay in this environment that is changing uh, one every two days, yeah. And what was the last question? The, the restraint stress, yeah. Um, it's uh, in a falcon tube, so easy, cheap. Um, it's actually quite a related question. I just want to have to do this typically when you do this, you can put something in the isolate them this for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
on the corner beach and the city center. We have um, experienced the 24 hour. Is it like much fever of the patient? Um, I don't know, actually. I didn't do it for 24 hours, but really, I didn't do it uh, originally because what everything I've read about 24 uh, isolation, 24 hours isolation, was that it will promote dramatically dopaminergic release. Um, and it was a papers by, um, um, I think it's Michael Carr. Uh, who was doing this uh, 24 hours isolation and sh and was interested in, in dopaminergic release, showing that it changed, uh, it really uh, changed dramatically dopamine. So I just wanted to avoid that period. And okay, but I'm not sure if it's enough, but uh, what we did was six days of isolation and it doesn't seem to be quite enough to promote um, uh, a large, large uh, duration of uh, social behavior, which was in our hands, in our minds. So that's, yeah, to be, yeah. <laughs> okay. And the um, male interaction and localization we saw that the infection of some types of brand with the biologist of the yeah, but I assume these were animals. No, no, you that they major change because I assume they're trying to establish more high energy. Yeah, they, they are definitely during the task, you mean, or after, after the task. Because during the task, uh, that what we have uh, studied with uh, Fabrice over there uh, and uh, the animals, and it's only the addict animals, so uh, uh, they are uh, doing a lot of different types of behavior and they are establishing their hierarchy. And that's what uh, I was really interested in um, because it's a dynamic process. But, and they are encountering uh, uh, animals that have they have never seen before and that were not isolated themselves. So uh, the only animal which is isolated is the one that uh, has the chance to explore a little bit this environment before for um, 20, 30 minutes. So it's really it's really a task that is uh, dedicated to drive uh, um, dominant behavior, but it didn't trigger aggressiveness. So that's very interesting. And that's why we're using this train of animals, which is Black Six, because they and we, we, we um, published a paper a few years ago about the comparison between strains in the same task. And some strains, like the CD1 or the 129 SV line, they uh, exhibit a lot of aggressivity in this task. So dominance level, it's um, completely different than, uh, than aggressiveness. And we also showed that we can uh, segregate them pharmacologically. So uh, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, and that's probably my, my view is that that's why we have a high number of vocalization because it's related to dominant, to uh, dominant behavior and not to aggressiveness because when there is aggressivity, there is no vocalization at all. Okay, so uh, the last question before no, uh, the question is about what we are looking for, what specific organization properties or factors are we looking for just to uh, do this proper individual of the noise. Individual? You mean the way animals are known? Uh, the question is about individual profiles of the noise. Oh, okay. So uh, individual profiles during, I guess, all social profiles, if I understand, uh, I'm not sure I understand, but okay. Uh, okay, um, we are uh, recording vocalization in during the social interaction. So we are uh, analyzing all types of vocalization during the social interaction uh, in that case. So, um, but when we are looking for the social profiles, we are analyzing a lot of social uh, parameters uh, such as um, the duration of contact, of course, but who is approaching, who is escaping, um, who is following uh, each other, um, what animals are uh, initiating the contact and interrupting the contact, um, and many other 
Uh, well, we are recording them, so I don't know what I can say more. We are just measuring uh, the number, the duration, and the frequency. But I've shown here only mean frequency, but we are uh, also having, of course, the mean and the maximum frequency, minimum and maximum frequency. Thank you. Okay. One more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I'm Francesca from Italy. And the question is a lot more technical. In how did you uh, recognize and uh, classify the organization for males and females when they are collecting the same cage? Um, males and females, okay. I'm not sure I understand, but is it, is it, you mean during the social interaction task, as animals are by pairs, we don't know who is vocalizing? That's what yeah. you're asking? Yeah, I mean, for example, with the social and experience, yeah. when they're collecting the same position, yeah. the same cage, yeah. how do you, how do you uh, yeah, we classify the same males and females? But animals are not together in the same cage, the same males and females, if, I, I'm, if I'm understanding your question. Males and females are in separated cages, okay? Okay. You run some experiments running at the same time and interactively in the same page. No, 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 we didn't. Uh, we, we don't want to have reproduction for the moment. So we don't do this. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.